Hey, Jeff. Good to see you. Hey, Bonnie. Oh, <laughs> is it Bonnie or Lorraine? It's Lorraine, isn't it? Who knows? Sorry. <laughs> Should we do that again? That's uh, all right. But yeah, I'll edit in you saying something very erudite. Excellent. Um, good to see you again. Thanks for joining me here for another little bit of mischief. You, you too. Yeah. And I'll just set us up briefly. Why are we here? Uh, this is an unusual one. I, I was kind of thinking in a funny way, this is a response to a question I sometimes get, like, do you ever do anything just for fun? Like, you mm -hmm. know, you're always beetling away on data sets and, you know, trying to rewire the global industrial complex. What do you do for fun? And I was like, well, I, I like to read and I like to think about what I'm reading. And then of course that leads to you and I exchanging some book ideas and, uh, hopping on this call. So really my intention here is just to explore a couple books that we've both been reading uh, that feel like a lot of rich possibility to talk about. So it's as, it's as simple and as complex as that. So that's why I'm here. I'll just quickly introduce me and then invite you to introduce yeah. you. Um, and in the context of this conversation, I suppose I'm who I always am. I'm a person who dreams of an economy that serves life, where all industry is part of a healing, restorative, and, and real path of wellness for humans and all life on earth. Um, I feel like we've got a long way to go to get there, and so I apply my expertise in environmental, social, and governance, disclosure, and awareness to move towards that. And even though these books aren't about that, and that's not really what this conversation is about, I feel like that's sort of who I am awake, asleep, reading, writing, running, and playing. So I bring that lens in, and then I'm really here to just explore some really interesting literature in the context of our friendship and our long years of working together. So that's me, and over to you to say a little about who you are. Yeah, thank you. So uh, so we've known each other, what, um, 15 years-ish, something like that, from when we are at Sustainability. Um, and I was, you'd been in the field for quite a while. Um, I was recently into it having, um, kind of found out about climate change and so forth while I was working in the tech world and switched careers to go and work at sustainability. But I think since then we've, we've, um, although our backgrounds have been very different, we're both pursuing this idea of an economy in service of life. And, um, so after, after getting frustrated doing traditional sustainability consulting for a few years, um, I left to found FutureFit Foundation and come up with an open source approach which attempted to define what a truly sustainable business would look like and how to measure progress towards it. And that's the FutureFit Business Benchmark, um, which is still open, freely available. Everyone's um, or anyone can go and download it and use it. Um, but we never really set the world alight with that because it, it was almost as if many businesses have an immune response to doing anything as transformational as that um so i think in the last three or four years i've got steadily more disillusioned with the idea that all we need to do is give people the right tools and the right explanations and everything will magically work out um so a year ago i um i left future fit to uh, pursue other things um and one of those things is to spend much more time on fun reading um so i've i've got a ridiculous pile of books i'm sure you're yeah. the same um lining the walls of my flat uh, many gathering dust um you know the my my road to hell is paved with unread books <laughs> <laughs> um it's, it's ridiculous how many books I've got. But of course, I thought I can remedy that because part of the problem with with um, not reading all those books is that I travel a lot. So I thought, well, I'll get a Kindle and then I'll be able to read a lot more. But now, of course, I've got 200 unread books on my Kindle. So same problem duplicated. But anyway, um, since um, leaving Future Fit behind about a year ago, um, I've devoted much more time to reading again. Mm. But I have found... A couple of things. Firstly, um, reading factual stuff about the state of the world, I've found harder and harder to do. The, mm -hmm. the more I understand about where we are, the more I find that, you know, incrementally adding to that just doesn't feel helpful. I don't think it's good. It doesn't nourish my soul, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but likewise, contemporary fiction, anything that's about the world today and 
you know, the challenges we've got, even at the level of individual relationships or whatever, I find quite paralyzing. So I've I've found myself drawn to more historical fiction or sci-fi. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was in that vein that um I when when you suggested the Boudicca books to me, um, I leapt at the chance, right? But I've I've also read a few things on the sci-fi side that that have have led me to think, okay, maybe we need to think beyond how do we incrementally improve what we've got now and reimagine something new. So that's kind of what brought me here. Um, and then yes, we'll I guess we'll get on to talk about the books now and and the differences and and so forth. But that's kind of where I am. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. And just in case anyone actually watches this because I have no idea what I'm going to do with it and if anyone's having a deja vu they're like wait haven't we seen you two talking about other stuff before our last conversation was about diving into investor communications and how we understand the dialogue between executives and investors and I'll, I'll make that easy to find here but I just raised that because I think it really underscores what you just described about your journey working with companies and seeing that immunity to a a new and better way. Um, So yeah, let's circle ourselves into the books here and I'll just set up what, what sparked this conversation for me was that you essentially, I think the only time I ever remember you doing this. So we've, we've had a lot of conversations about a lot of things. We've certainly talked about books we've read or books we want the other to read over the years. As one does, you read a book you love. You're like, Oh my God, you got to read this. But I think this was the first time ever in my memory of our friendship where you were like, you have to read this book. Do you have it? Do you have a copy? Okay, you don't have a copy. Okay, I'm going to get you a copy. And you live in London and I live in Montreal. And like 48 hours later, there was a copy at my door. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, now, I, you know, it's my comeuppance, right? Because I have a pattern of saying to people, you included, like, no, no, you've got to read this book. No, no, like, I really want you to read this book. You know, Marjorie Kelly comes to mind. I've pressed uh, the divine right of capital into many hands. Um, And so I was kind of like, well, I've done that to a lot of people. It seems only right that you're doing it to me now. And I trust your judgment. I'm very curious. And of course, that book was The Story of B by Daniel Quinn. And in in tandem, I happened to be reading the Boudicca series by Amanda Scott. And we'll we'll dive into a little bit more of both of those in a sec. Um, oh yeah, and I was meant to introduce the Boudicca series. I've gone way off script here. So let me let me jump back to let me get to the first principles of this conversation. Yeah. You insisted that I read the story of B by Daniel Quinn. And you you get the you get that by sending you the book, it guilted you into putting it to the top of the reading pile. Oh yeah, yeah. And it also made it really easy because I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll get it. I've been meaning to join the library here where I've moved. And meanwhile, I had been reading the Boudicca series by Amanda Scott. And I'll explain a little bit how I got to those because that's a not a set of books that I would it it just wouldn't normally be on my radar. I haven't typically read historical fiction, which is what the Boudicca series is. Um, it's a four part, quite thick, <laughs> thick four yeah. part books on um, the invasion, uh, the Roman invasion of Britain that takes place shortly after, um, I guess, the early years of AD. So AD, I may get this a little off, but AD 30 something to AD 60 something is the span of the four books. And um they are like rich characters and a lot of battle scenes, a lot of different parts happening. We meet lots of things going on in Britain, in Rome. So very complex plots. And yet, as I was reading them, honestly, four pages in, I was gripped. I Mm -hmm. felt my dreams being uh, connected to what I was reading. It was a very, very visceral experience. I I happened into the books because Manda actually um, interviewed me on her podcast. So along with being a best-selling author and doing all kinds of amazing literary feats, um, she is also the host of the Accidental Gods podcast. And I was very fortunately recommended as a guest for her by our common friend, Gary Turner, actually. And so I was hosted on her podcast quite innocently uh, just about a year ago. Um, sure, I love being on podcasts and I love sharing what I'm learning and learning from other people. And Amanda was such a kind and generous host and true confession. And 
man, I really hope you're not actually watching this. It wasn't until after that I did proper homework because I was like, who's this amazing person that just hosted me on this? Of course, I looked her up and read a bit about her profile, but I didn't realize until afterwards. And thank goodness I would have been probably like mortified fangirling that she's this incredible best-selling author. So it's like, I should really take a look at those books. Started mm. reading the Boudicca series and just tumbled on in. And there's lots more we'll get into, but the, the key thing that leads us to this conversation now is although they are very different books, the Boudicca series is the Roman invasion of Britain, takes place 2000 years ago, etc. The story of B, uh, which I'll, I'll ask you to say a bit more about in a sec, is, is a totally different kind of story, different scope, different timeline, etc. Yet reading them in parallel, I was like, wow, this is speaking to us as sustainability professionals, as people creating a new economy now, or trying to breathe life into an existing one that's all around us. Mm -hmm. And that made me really want to talk to you more about it. So that's the very preambly setup for this conversation. And the way we've structured it is um, I've invited you to think of two questions for me, and I have two questions for you. And um, I'm gonna, we're just gonna trade questions. So I'll kick off by asking you a question. Curious your thoughts and then, oh. Well, yes, that is what we're gonna do, but we were also gonna briefly, I was gonna briefly talk about what the story of B actually is as well. Yes, so my yeah. first question for you is gonna prompt you to do that. I was gonna just okay, gonna fine. That. Well, Perfect. that's not really how we scripted it, but roll. Fair enough, <laughs> Fair enough. yeah. Very tight, this stand down crew, everything's fine. <laughs> Yeah, that's Joni sleeping over there. Um, okay, so here's my first question for you. And and in so answering, please uh, go deeper into the story of B. Yeah, okay. So you handed me this, well, you didn't hand, you thrust it upon me with urgency and said, please read yeah. it now. And that's one fact. Another fact is you and I work in very similar fields. We've spoken a bit about our work. We don't do the same work, but it's very complementary, and we've worked a lot together. So I guess my question for you, as we're dreaming about shifting business models, really changing economic norms, and you're like, you got to read the story of B, are those two things connected? And if so, how and why? Yeah, very connected. Um, so, so the story of B, so how this uh, came about um, on April 22nd, Earth Day, uh, which is also my 52nd birthday this year. Um, I met up with my brother uh, to go and see a football match in Liverpool. Um, and just before the match, he handed me my birthday present, which was a book, which was the story of B. And it was a novel. And I thought, this is, this is odd. My brother has never read a novel in his life. He only reads factual stuff. So how did he even know about this thing? Um, but he, what he explained was that this chap called Daniel Quinn wrote a book called Ishmael, which he'd had recommended to him by a, I think by a professor in the US working on climate change. Um, and that itself, Ish, Ishmael was a novel. Um, but it's really, it's framed as a novel, but it's really a thesis about where the world is today um, and how it came to be. Okay. Um, and my brother was halfway through reading this and um, decided to buy me the second book in this series. It's, there's three books in the series, and that was the story of B. Um, and they they cover similar ground, but you don't have to read them in order. So I started reading Story of B. Um, and it was really like a light coming on for me. Um, it's, it's framed as a novel. Um, it's um, superficially about a priest in the US for a relatively small religious order. Um, and he's asked by someone higher up in the order to go over to Europe to investigate um, these rumors that the Antichrist has appeared. And he's going around Europe talking and converting people and so forth. Um, and this chap is very skeptical, but you know, goes over to Europe and, and ends up going finding this this chap and going to some of his talks and these talks are all given effectively as lectures um about where we are what the state of the world is how we got here um don't let the framing of the the antichrist 
put you off because it's it's nothing like that. But you can see once you dig into the the central thesis why um, people in a church might feel threatened by the ideas put across. Okay, um, so. Digging it so superficially, it's about this priest going and and you know following this chap and um, hearing what he's got to say. But the the meat of the book is what is it he's actually saying, and what it boils down to is that um, humans lived in harmony with nature for as and as an integral part of it for around two hundred thousand years. Okay, um, it's only the last ten thousand years or so that we've somehow gone off the rails and become an almost cancerous growth in the web of life that has you know resulted in us changing the climate extracting resources beyond the planet's ability to regenerate etc cetera, etc cetera. right so all the things that we we struggle with now and i i found this quite illuminating because it's easy to think if you've worked in this space for any length of time it's easy to think that humans are the problem that it is something genetic about us, that we're some kind of genetic aberration. Um, but the reality is this interesting fact that no, for 200,000 years, modern humans were doing it right. And we were living in harmony with the web of life and, and, and each other. Um, and what happened, and in that time, there were thousands of regional cultures that thrived and coexisted together as neighbors, sometimes lasting for millennia. Each of these peoples had its own unique culture. Their beliefs and actions might seem completely bewildering to even to their neighbors, but they all somehow managed to live in harmony with, um, with the natural world. There wasn't one right way to live, but there was a kind of formula for success. And the way it's framed in the story of B is that this is about um, those cultures respecting the law of life. Okay. And we don't have to get into details now, but it's basically around, you know, don't exterminate your competition for food. Don't destroy your competitors' food supply and don't deny access to food to others. Everything else is fair game. Okay, So tribes would war with each other. They would trade with each other and so forth. But they ultimately wouldn't try and subjugate each other and force them to live their own way. And in the book, these cultures are all labeled labeled as lever cultures because they effectively lived in balance with the broader web of life on earth, leaving others, humans or non-humans, to do the same, and, and effectively leaving their destiny in the hands of the gods. Mm. Okay, And that ties in nicely with Boudicca as we'll, we'll get to. Um, and the lever peoples were primarily hunter-gatherers, although they did embrace agricultural practices to a degree. Okay, So for example, by replanting the seeds of their favorite fruits. That kind of thing. Um, and of course, when you start to see it like this, that there were thousands of these cultures um, that all lived more, you know, as part of the natural world, not seeing themselves as, as in any way above it, um, you realize that the handful of indigenous communities around the world that, you know, we've been pushing to the margins are the remnants of those thousands of lever cultures. And, and now it's just starting to dawn on people in the sustainability space. Oh, maybe we can learn something from those peoples. Um, but they really were pushed to the edge. And that started when a specific culture rose around 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent and really embraced uh, what the book calls totalitarian agriculture. So agriculture at the expense of all else. And what's, what's super interesting is that by, by basically putting farming first and and focusing on that entirely um everyone ended up having to work much harder hunter gatherers had actually a much easier life just you know living hand to mouth but in a world of abundance farming became much more controlling you know having to spend 10 12 hours a day working in fields etc but the payoff was that you could generate a tremendous surplus of food and that surplus of food gave, effectively gave you a cushion of security into the future. But of course, as soon as you get a surplus of food, you get the ability to lock up that surplus. So that was the kind of start of 
dominant power structures within society or within that particular society and the need to constantly expand your farming area and therefore push out the other the other cultures around so in reading this the story of b um and subsequently i read ishmael and then the third book my ishmael all all in parallel to reading the buddhika books this is astonishing um the parallels there what i realized was that um the the buddhika books are really about rome's um invasion of britannia as it was then called and subjugation of the tribes and it's it's as simple as the romans being the takers or representative of the takers and the Achaeni and the other um, tribes in, in um, Britain effectively being the lever cultures that were all living in kind of in harmony. Yes, there were, there were kind of, there was, you know, a, a constant kind of jostling, but there was never an attempt to subjugate any others or, or take their resources or whatever. And, and the, the Boudicca series it, it felt like it's it's almost as if Manda has read Ishmael and the story of B and then thought, okay, how could I document how this actually happened in a particular region of the world? Um, and it would be fascinating to actually ask her, you know, have you have you read these books? Um, so so when I you'd been banging on at me to read the Boudicca books as I as I got hold of Story of B. So the fact that we've both been working in this space for so many years. Um and then come across these things literally within weeks of each other was was astonishing to be reading these in parallel. So that's why as soon as I, you know, I was only about a quarter of the way into Story of B when I when I posted you a copy, because I thought you have to not only experience this, but you have to experience it while you're experiencing Judica. So you see, you almost see his here's the looking back over the 10,000 years as to how we've got here. Um, and here's a documented part of of that story as it actually happened cool i love that answer um okay you're you're up to ask me a question although i want to like spar with you on that answer but but ping me with a question to see what happens yeah so um so i mean my my question to you would be um what was it about the two series of books that made you suggest we discuss them in combination? Yeah, so um, it's funny because I remember how we come to the books differently than what you just described. So first mm, of all, okay. thank you for explaining the story of B. You did a much better job of explaining it than I did of the Boudicca series, partly just because I'm very humbled by the depth of historical information in the Boudicca series. Um, actually, there's a lot in the story of B2, like as you describe, it's in some ways a history of all of humanity. It kind of eats Uval Harari's, um, uh, gosh. Yeah, Sapiens. Thank you for lunch. Yeah. I mean, it made Sapiens look like a kind of afternoon open house at kindergarten, to be blunt. Um, so there's a lot of historical information in story of B in a very kind of lyrical, accessible, inviting way. It's it's a complex book done mm. beautifully simply. Um, the Boudicca series is uh, packed with historical facts at a very um, local level. So as you say, it's almost like one example yeah. of the taker culture and the lever culture meeting and what happens um and you know i don't even well so to be super transparent i think i knew rome invaded britannia but mm. barely like i knew there was such thing as the pax romana it sounds like mm, that seems peaceful <laughs> it's like wait yeah. why did why did we need peace i had never interrogated that i grew up in north america i grew up in canada and just like I was able to graduate with a university degree and not know that there were still residential schools open and teaching First Nations children, mm -hmm. I also grew up not knowing that Rome invaded Britannia. Some big gaps. Um, I'm owning them, doing all I can in my humble powers to learn now. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to skim over a lot of the, the depth of the Boudicca series um, and mostly just explain why I wanted to talk to you about these. And what I was going to say is, I think I'm the one who, in response to you saying you've got to read the story of B, was like, but wait, I'm reading the Boudicca series, which I think you need to read. So I kind of remember it happening in a different order. I think, well, I think what happened was I said, you've got to read this book. Right. And you said, well, I'm in the midst of these other books at the moment. And you really need to read these. <laughs> cool. That's good. That so actually sounds very plausible. It, it really um, was contemporaneous. It was incredible, really. Yeah. OK. And I had already read and kind of forgotten about um, Ishmael. Ishmael. Yeah. Daniel Quinn's Ishmael. And I read that on the very wonderful recommendation of Bob Willard. Oh, who wow. We both yeah. know as yeah. I connected you as prior to the founding of um, yeah. Future Fit and folks paying very close attention, all you know, three of you uh, may remember that Bob was one of the stakeholders for an assessment I did of TD Bank. And we had a really interesting conversation around economics and business models, et cetera. I'll, I'll make a point of making that findable here. Um, so Bob is a deep thinker in sustainability, in business models, in how we may, you know, uh, improve ourselves out of the mess, if you will. And years ago, he recommended to me Ishmael. Hmm. And I read it and I remember thinking, this is amazing. I love this book, but it, it didn't quite stick. Hmm. Or it, it felt true, but I wasn't sure what to do with it. And then yeah. I was reading the Boudicca series because the Man of Scott conversation really made me kind of hyper aware, like, wow, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm missing. And then you recommend Story of B. I start reading them at the same time. And then it was almost like what Bob was trying to tell me all those years yeah. ago landed. And I was struck. So when I say that in the first pages of reading the Boudicca series, I really felt the stories affecting my dreams. Um, so when I'll unspool a little bit more about the stories themselves. Um, the the people we meet in Britannia, and you, in my mind, I've been pronouncing it Asini, but you say, is it? Well, this is super interesting. So I, well, I'll get to, get to this when I, when, where I grew up and stuff, but yeah, I grew up thinking they were called the Iceni. Iceni, okay. Right. Um, and, and I think there's some idiosyncrasy over the spelling there. In the book, it starts with an E, but I'd, I'd always seen it with an I. Um, and I thought it was pronounced Boudicca as well instead okay. of yeah uh, yeah. Uh, but then I actually the first of the Boudicca books I got in audiobook form, so that's that's why I said Akeni and Boudicca because uh, mm -hmm. I assume that the audiobook readers who read it beautifully, by the way, it's it's really really good. Um, the, right. Presumably, they know what they're doing with the with the pronunciation. And so you say Isini. No, say it again. Isini. Isini. Yeah, Isini. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in my, I've only ever read the words with my, like, quietly in my head. Yeah. So I'm pronouncing it Ikeni without knowing what I'm saying. Isini. Uh, so you meet, I'm meeting these people through Manda's work. Mm. And I am struck by their connectedness by their connections to their dreams, like mm. literally when they're sleeping. But dreaming means so much more in these stories. It's far beyond, you know, you close your eyes and your subconscious brings some images and plots to the surface and then you wake up and they kind of dissipate throughout the day. Dreaming is a far more powerful force of knowledge and uh, decision-making, information, connecting, feeling, and that I'm getting goosebumps even as I say it, because that has felt true to me since forever without having the kind of language or frankly community to back me up. Um, it's just felt like one of those things that has made me a bit strange. <laughs> and so reading these books, I would read a dozen or so pages at night and then sleep. And I, my dreamscapes were, it was like somebody took a bunch of locks off the doors mm -hmm. and was like, there, see, this is how you are wired. And mm -hmm. I don't mean I, Lorraine Smith, I mean, 
we, our yeah. human minds are wired this way. And I've kept, I think, some of that instinctiveness around. I've been probably a bit more free to speak my dreams and speak my like inner weird uh, than some, but I've still felt the forces of kind of locking it up and getting into that totalitarian agriculture regime that says, this is normal. This is what we do. This is what we're striving for. And if you want to be different, you better have a clear business case for it. Right. Um, so yeah. as I've been going into the Boudicca series and learning, like learning who went where, when, and of course it's historical fiction, but um, I actually had a great chat with Amanda Scott, some of which is, is video. Again, I'll make sure that's easy okay. to find here where she talks a lot about how she came to bring the stories to bear because I was so intrigued by it. I was like, this is incredible. And because we had the connection through the podcast and have kept in touch and become friends, I was like, can I ask you some more questions? Cause now I realize like who you are. Just, Absolutely. So we had this great chat and she unpacks a lot more of how she came to be able to tell these stories. Brilliant. And I'll have to watch that. Yeah, it's it's really neat. Of course, she's making many leaps, right? It's it's not a documentary. Yeah. Yet it is powerfully grounded in things that are knowable. Hmm. So as I've been reading these stories, and and as you described so well, experiencing this kind of taker meets lever. And, you know, mm. what happens? And we're getting to know the characters, the people, the families. I'm reading Story of B, which I don't, I, I've now read it, but that's the kind of book I wouldn't read before bed. I read it between work stints or perhaps yeah. a cafe, just switching gears, awake in my kind of regular day job, if you will, whatever that is. And it's blowing my mind. I'm like, wait a minute. And what's particularly blowing my mind about it is that it was published in 1996. So presumably Daniel Quinn was writing that in the years prior. So mm. that's the early to mid nineties. And I'm thinking about what was going on in the world. Then we've got the collapse of the iron curtain. We've got, you know, d interesting dialogue around nuclear proliferation. We've got changes to the, um, industrial complex where we're you know we've separated church and state with uh investing and banking the whole you know glass steagall has has now like fully taken hold the way the uh, financialization of the markets is possible in ways that it wasn't when you know when early industrial activity was happening so we're we're in the early days of globalization we aren't um, digitalized the way we are now, but the conditions for that are being set. The die is being cast. And you and I are kind of coming of age professionally. We're both born in 1971. I'm clueless. I'm like, I'm working at World Wildlife Fund thinking like, yeah, we're going to like save endangered species and spaces. But I, And I'm like, but something feels weird, you know? So reading this book, it was like going back decades, like, mm. yeah, something was weird. Something is weird. The way we are functioning as a society, it, it's it's basically the the backstory of the Truman Show. Yeah, that's how it felt to me. It felt like yeah. the before the writers and director of the Truman Show, and I don't have a clue about the real backstory of the Truman Show, but it felt to me like before the writers and directors did all their things for the Truman Show, they all read this. Yeah, and then it was like now we'll help little modern people understand it. So you giving me story of B while I was reading Boudicca, trying to crack the nut of like, we aren't just trying to save species and spaces. And, you know, spoiler alert for anybody who doesn't know us, you and I are both involved with the Possible Futures course. I'll just have to put a little pin in that to say like, when you're doing that in the kind of context of all this other stuff, you just realize like, whoa, nothing is as it seems. And yeah. we have real work to do. Not nothing is as it seems like, so I'm just going to drop acid or, you know, microdose mushrooms all day and ecstatic dance and hang out with my friends, like, which is would be fine if that's what you want to do. But you and I have committed our lives to making real change to industrial norms. So once you see these things, once I see these things, I can't unsee them. Yeah. And so seeing all that together, I was like, I really want to 
talk to you more. I really want to be here with you now having this conversation just to notice the connections, yeah. interconnections, etc. So, I mean, yeah, that's kind of a meta, like, that's my reason for wanting to talk to you about talking, yeah. about talking to you. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> no, that, that makes, that makes complete sense. And um, yeah, it, it, it is still, it, I, I'm grateful to the universe for having put both sets of books into my hands at once, because I suspect that, you know, part of the reason that Ishmael maybe didn't land with you to such a degree at the time was that there's almost a multiplying factor of being mm -hmm. able to read these two together right it, it kind of cements yeah. it there's something i wanted to pick up on which is your point about dreaming mm -hmm. um, i've so so just for for anyone um watching um when we talk about dreaming generally we mean what you do when you're asleep mm -hmm. right or we mean thinking about what you want in the future yeah right but that's but what you do when you're asleep there's really kind of no control over it's just something that happens to you and what you want in the future tends to be what do you want in the future in the context of the culture in which you live right what what do you want that culture can supply you and in the the Boudicca books dreaming is one of the two um vocations that everybody aspires to it's you either want to become a warrior and represent your tribe and you know protect it from the other tribes and so forth or you want to become a dreamer and really understand the world or the will of the gods um and help guide what the tribe should do and and the dreamers are the source of wisdom so it, it's and and the dreamers will go into a dreamlike state and and we've probably all uh, seen films where there's kind of shamanic rites or you know um the native americans um or or people from you know other indigenous communities around the world who all have their equivalent of um the, this dreaming sense um but it is it's really the way the whole thing was governed um, so very different from our current conception of a dream being like, oh, I want a, I want a big house and I want to be famous. Yeah, totally. Um, so, but what's what's been really interesting to me, and it only occurred to me while you were talking, was that I've been listening to the audiobooks of Boudicca, right? And I've got into the habit, and it's a terrible habit to have. Um, I tend to wake up about three in the morning every every morning. Right. Um, and I have done for years. Now, usually I can get back to sleep unless I've got something, you know, really pressing on my mind work wise or whatever. I, I get back to sleep quite quickly. But I've got into the habit that I put Boudicca on. Right. So I, I put whatever wherever I'm up to in the book, I put the book and there's four books. I'm on just started the fourth, and I'm already like feeling the loss that. Now those hours are counting down. It's oh my god, when's she going to write a fifth? <laughs> um, but so I found that I'm actually going into my dreams, hearing these stories, which is super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm so I set the I set the timer on the on the Audible app so that it's going to stop after fifteen minutes, and before I start it, I look at where I am in the chapter because. Sometimes I'll I'll fall asleep within seconds once it starts. Other times I'll get through the 15 minutes and I'll renew the timer. Like the other morning, I, I listened to it for two hours before I fell asleep again. But but what's what's interesting is that sometimes I'm in that kind of half sleep state where you you kind of hear it and then you realize you might have missed a chunk. And so I I go back. Um and it's just yeah, it's just a reflection that that the audiobook version has allowed me to experience it almost in a dreamlike state at times wow. and then go back and listen to it again during the day. And that's been really nice. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, I think for me, it, the books were, there was a bit of a more personal connection because you mentioned you 
you know, you kind of knew that Rome had invaded Britain um, and or you knew that happened, but no really no real details. When I was growing up, I was growing up in a small town in Norfolk, which is for anyone listening who doesn't know the UK, um, the, there's a there's a big bump on the right hand side that kind of if you if you were to walk down from that bump, you'd eventually hit London. And that's Norfolk. And that's um, a very flat, um, boring area, but geographically boring area. Um, but it's where um, that whole area is part of the Iceni territory. And so some of my earliest memories, uh, my dad was very into nature and getting out outdoors a lot. And um, some of the um, some of my er earliest memories are going to visit two things. One was a Stone Age flint mine where you could actually go and see this mine and actually get lowered down into it and see this, you know, huge, great kind of cylindrical tube with flint that people used to mine. And there was a little museum to the side and stuff. And the other was an Iceni village. And it was a reconstruction of a village from those times. So so I, I've known this name Iceni since I can remember, since I was about five or six. And, and for me, this village was fascinating because it was like an it was like the perfect place for a kid it was like almost like one of these um uh, modern play areas that's made of wooden poles and things that you can climb on right there were you know there were uh rope bridges between trees and there, there was this is like the great hall where they used to meet and and all this kind of stuff but you could as a kid you could explore this stuff it was amazing so i, I don't know how many times i went there but i had very vivid memories of this place um, so, so for me, it was super interesting to read these books and hear how they actually lived. Um, I think my reflections though, are that it's really changed how I feel about the, that part of the, of the country where I grew up. Um, so I lived there until I was about 11. Um, I, I was out in nature a lot because my dad's favorite punishment when me or my brother, did something wrong um was he he used to say right two miles and we'd be like oh dad and it'd be four miles but dad he'd six miles generally when he got to eight miles we would realize okay it's time to shut up right and basically what he was doing he loved going walking so he used us being you know tearaways as an excuse to drag us out for a long walk um, so it was our it was a fairly frequent punishment that we would be doing eight mile walks around the Norfolk countryside. And I felt like I got a good appreciation for nature through that. And of course, we talked about all sorts of things with him and learned about the species would come across and, and everything else. Um, and it was it was brilliant, formative experience. Um, and I'm really glad that was the punishment rather than the traditional go to your room. Um, <clears throat> but what I've realized is that going through the Boudicca books is that that wasn't really natural world at all. You know, when, when the Yukani or Iceni were living there, everything was forested. The, the abundance of, of animals and just, I mean, the, 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 the kind of most protected wood you could possibly come across and enjoy now in small pockets was just the entire country and so what we think about as the countryside in the uk and you think of the the barren highland uplands in scotland which have a rugged beauty to them but they're basically dead mm -hmm. you know, the only thing living there is, is bracken and a few grouse um that's not how it was mm -hmm. and it was really and you see in the Boudicca series with the you know the romans um, building their their new cities and and towns and their fortifications and and effectively having to fuel this war machine and you know keep warm tens of thousands of soldiers that were invading and so forth. I mean the entire land basically got stripped and has never really recovered. So what we think of as as nature now is actually a, a patchwork of really artificial fields populated by. Um, animals which are quite a long way away from their wild equivalents or wild forebears. Um, so it's it's really changed how I see the country I've grown up in. Um, and and yeah, now 
um, there are only pockets of what I think uh, the Boudicca would recognize. Um, Norfolk, it's so flat um, that there was a saying that you can stand anywhere in Norfolk and you can see a church spire. Mm. Um, and it's it, it's fairly true, actually. If you go walking around Norfolk, you can, you know, they're the only things that you really see above the horizon. And and I always thought that was that was a nice thing in the sense that because the only other things you see are nature, right? But now I realize actually the only reason you see those church spires is because so few trees around. So yeah. Um the other thing I would say is it's really opened up my understanding of how far people used to travel in those days. Uh, because when you um, I've only just discovered that Mona, which is the island that the dreamers all live on, that um, is features very prominently in the books, is Anglesey, mm -hmm. which is a very long way away from some of the areas where the tribes are based. Um, but they, you know, they were roaming right the way across the country regularly, just you know, using nothing but horses um, through each other's territory. Um, the the way the book uses symbolism um the way it it relies on you know people recognize each other by the shape of their brooch or the color of their cloak or all of this kind of stuff it's it, it's incredible it's um and it is it feels like um every everything that's described is is very sensory the colors the sounds the the metaphors that are used to describe people's the color of people's hair or their eyes or the expression that passes across their face they're all of the natural world mm -hmm. you know it's it's the the color of moonlight or the sound of a stream or whatever it is it's, it's like everything just kind of it blends the human and the non-human in ways that you almost can't see where the edges are um and i think all of that sorry i've been rambling but i think all of that has has just um made me realize how my upbringing which i thought was close to nature was still incredibly disconnected from it probably closer than for many people mm -hmm. but more clo closer to let's say i i grew up a lot in the outdoors but not in nature mm -hmm. No, that's brilliant. And it's not rambling. It's a it's a beautiful answer to the question that I, I had primed you with, but hadn't asked out loud, which was, you know, how do you understand your upbringing differently now, having mm. grown up where the books, not all the books don't take place entirely there. But as you say, it's a no, no. part of the story. So, uh, yeah, it's mm. really, really interesting to hear. Um, I'm going to reflect a little bit on what you said and then invite you to, to put the last question. Yeah to me um i don't know if you remember this but it feels less painful now when i hear you say all the things you're saying but do you remember when i was meant to go on a trip to ethiopia from the uk so i've been in the uk for work and then yeah. i was meant to carry on and go to ethiopia and i was going to do my first visit there but i got really really sick mm. and i ended up staying with our common friend elvira and yep. then I couldn't fly home because I had this horrible ear infection. So to convalesce, I went to the Brecon Beacon Mountains. Oh, God. Yeah, I remember you telling me this. Yeah. And and it was an amazing trip for all kinds of reasons and lots of things I could say there. But the reason I bring it up here is because I had, that's when I had my very most, I had a crazy fever, right? Like I basically had a nest of squirrels in my ears doing, I don't know what, to my brain, running a very high fever for quite a while. And I just spent time alone walking and I met some trees. So mm. I met some very big old trees. But what happened when I met those big old trees is I, at first it was like, wow, this is a really cool tree. I mean, who doesn't love to see a big old tree, right? They're amazing. Yeah. And I went from really excited to see this big old tree and then walk a little further to see another one and then walk a little further to see another one to realizing like, you know, you have that kind of touristic thought of like, wow, like this tree, it's got to be hundreds of years old. Yeah, yeah. And then to do the like, well, gosh, what what has this tree witnessed from a kind of human 
time scale perspective, like what's happened in those hundred years from a human history perspective. Of course, remembering at this time, I don't know about the invasion of Rome. <laughs> so I'm thinking of more basic things like world wars, etc., cetera, um, and what I can fathom right? Like I'm from the new world. So what was going on here that was, was bringing people to the terrain that I'm raised in. So I'm having very simplistic thoughts like that. And then as I'm roving and healing and able to walk a little bit further each day, I was there for about two weeks, I think. Um, I had this like, I mean, epiphany feels too shallow a word. It was basically like a tree grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and was like, you moron, you're missing the point here. You only see us, but we are of a community. Mm. And most of that community is gone. Mm. And when we were seedlings or smaller trees, we were a forest. And mm. what you see now, you think is a bucolic scene of grazing sheep, but those are basically pre-slaughterhouse meat products yeah. grazing in a clear cut. Yeah. And you don't see bucolic fields as a clear cut, even though I'm an industrial tree planter. I know tree, I know clear cuts, but clear cuts here are different. They're fresher. You can smell the sawdust. Yeah. You can see the rows of plantations. The clear yeah. cut universe here, I recognize my eyes know how to read that landscape. But the bucolic farm views of whales are those are postcards mm. we see them as beautiful and i had this awareness like i am walking through killing fields tree killing fields i hadn't grasped the human loss at that time um and you know i was already minded towards like something's not quite working here but it, essentially the trees told me and when I came back to London and I was talking to you and I said, I, I realized I'm walking through these, you know, clear cuts with pre-slaughterhouse meat products grazing. And you were like, you've ruined whales. <laughs> so I'm very glad to hear that I wasn't actually responsible for ruining whales. Yeah, no, that's true. No, no, that's <laughs> true. It wasn't your fault. And whales isn't exactly ruined, but but these are realities that we are, we're not only shielded from them, we're trained to perceive beauty in the kind of shadow of atrocity. And I think we I think we continue to do that. That, I mean, to be blunt, that's mm -hmm. what gives me appetite for this conversation. Not to accuse ourselves of being ignorant, not to, you know, bemoan the foolishness of our ancestors, but to um to notice, like to be honest, yes, these are big, beautiful trees. I'm delighted they're still here. But kind of like we treat our elder humans, you know, we kind of warehouse them or we, we, you know, say nice things, but we don't really honor whence they came. And I think this is a gap that you and I and, and others who may choose to get to try to fill in. And, and another piece that comes up for me when, you know, when you described, I think, very well the premise of the story of B and how uh, Daniel Quinn or his character the the priest plays back the lectures of B and B is the chap as you call him and I won't give too much away but B is the source of this antichrist type um information and what what you were saying there how you know, it wasn't until about 10,000 years ago with the advent of totalitarian agriculture, which started to take over or move into other communities and kind of crush them and bend them to their will. What I hear other people saying quite a bit when, when that kind of thinking comes to the fore, and so I'm going to kind of proactively or offensively smack it down if anybody mm. is thinking this i often hear things like well you know we, we don't want to go back to the way it was. i mean what are you proposing that we just return to being hunters and gatherers and you know do you know how bad teeth decay was there and do you know do you know what the lifespan of people was oh, yeah. and there's a few things i want to say on that because first of all i don't know about you but i'm not proposing we like drop all of our modern amenities and go back to tribal life and um you know remove all forms of progress i i don't no, absolutely and, and neither and neither was daniel quinn exactly yeah 
And what I do propose is that people take a look, I take a look, you take a look, and anybody who cares to take a look at what myths you've bought into, like grazing sheep in a field is beautiful. Okay, yeah, I love sheep, you know, I spin. I love sheep. But let's let's not pretend that there aren't some not so beautiful things behind that. And so with something like, you know, but you know how short lifespans were, there's all kinds of incredible literature that shows how healthy people were before the advent of totalitarian mm. agriculture. And a book that comes to mind, I may get the, I think is James Nestor. I, I think I'm close. I'll make sure I write it correctly in the right. notes. Um, wrote a book called Breathe or Breath. <laughs> um, and essentially it's about breathing and how we breathe. And very simplistically about our nasal passage and our throat passage. And he does this incredible unpacking of the transition from pre- agricultural modern humans to post and mm. like 10,000 years ago, not just recently, okay. but also recently and how the negative impacts on our health, the negative impacts on our life expectancy from grain based diets, from agriculture based diets. So uh, I'm learning now, at least in my mind, if not out loud in conversation to challenge people, like, where are you getting that information? Why do you believe that up until the modern brilliance that we so espouse, we were all just randomly killing each other, dying of everything and unable to sustain anything. That is a, that is a weird myth. I think it's a harmful myth and it overrides the incredible wisdom and interconnectedness and ability to perceive and understand ourselves and, and the world around us. And I don't, think one has to to trample the other i think it's about an acceptance and a willingness to welcome ways of knowing and so we have you know the sustainability community and little bits and bobs of the other parts of business going yeah you know indigenous wisdom is really cool you know and it's like well okay sit with that for a moment like it's more than really cool and it's yeah. not a touristic adventure and it's not a you know a like an eco village it's a keyhole into a way that still is and actively was at a scale that we've been kind of mythologized into not understanding. And so for me, like what you just described about your childhood, you know, there's nothing wrong with going for long walks with your dad. And, and mm. it makes perfect sense that you experienced those the way you did. And now knowing what you know, seeing church spires and not forest that's that's a big mm. seeing if you will so that, that was a little bit of a diatribe you had you had one last yeah. question for me i don't know if you want to respond to that and then hit me and we'll, we'll yeah bring it here. so um it's interesting that I, I read an article recently um talking about addiction mm. and um we've typically for many years thought that the opposite of addiction was sobriety that mm. you're not addicted but that's just the absence of addiction the opposite of addiction um recent studies or an accumulation of studies that are now just becoming more mainstream aware is that the opposite of addiction is connection mm -hmm. and i think that this this ties in with something from the story of b which is developed further in my ishmael the third book uh, which you really need to read, <laughs> um, which is that the taker culture, our dominant culture, our conception of wealth is tied to that one difference between take or key difference between takers and leavers. It's the accumulation of things, mm -hmm. right? It's it's there can be a surplus, and so someone controls a surplus, and so wealth ends up being well, it's wealth is access to and control of surplus. Whereas in the lever cultures, wealth is a much more spiritual thing. It's it's the degree of connection you have with people, it's your ability to serve them and to know that they've got your backs. And and it mentions in my Ishmael that actually. Um, we see uh, cults, for example, modern day cults, as people who have somehow succumbed to some kind of collective lunacy. 
and when you know when there's been attempts to break up a cult um you know the members will sometimes choose mass suicide over like coming back into the you know so-called normal world yeah um and it makes the point that you know of, of course there's some lunatics involved in those things but the the depth of connection people feel that they don't feel they get in the outside world is something that they they want they are so desperate not to lose that they would rather take their own lives and and it makes the point that actually that is the depth of connection that the lever cultures feel that's how they measure wealth okay. so when you start to see wealth as something other than the accumulation of resources it does open up paths to thinking well maybe there is another way mm-hmm. whereas any conception of wealth any culture that sees wealth as the accumulation of resources it's very difficult to see how it could ever be sustainable yeah um which of kind of, of course is where we find ourselves now um so that was that was one point i wanted to reflect on uh there was another which i've forgotten so <laughs> <laughs> i'll ask you um the final question we jotted down which was what do you find appealing about the the Akeni way of life mm. and is there anything about it that you find abhorrent and then same question for the romans yeah um i'm betting my answer will spark the thing that that slipped out of your mind Probably. for sure i feel a strong affinity for the Akeni way um mm. the dreaming piece i i literally felt like a, a hand from across time put itself on my shoulder and said, you're not crazy. This mm. is how we are. You know, I felt like, I mean, I only know a bit about my ancestry. I'm white descended from Europeans, a kind of mishmash of French, Scottish, Lithuanian. So I don't really know where I go back, but I do know that we we all go back to indigenous cultures. I say that with some hesitation around like cultural appropriation and whatnot, but we we all go yeah. way, 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 way back. Yeah. Um, and so feeling the validation of the power and importance of dreaming mm. as as a resource, as a sense of knowledge, as a way to understand the world around us, not to like predict or have, you know, inklings. No, no, to like actually get what is happening. What is the stuff moving around us? What are these energies that are humans and weather and other animals? Um, I just, I, I love how we learn from the stories that it wasn't a kind of marginalized fetishized thing it's it's a thing it's like eating or sleeping or everything else um on the other hand there are elements that i i flinch at a little bit so for example it is kind of admirable and cool that women are warriors and they're just as tough and just as bloody and all the rest of it um and there's a scene i think it's in the first book where a a killing takes place as a battle scene and there's a lot of death and one of the warriors loses a fellow or sister warrior. And the, the phrase is something like, I forget the exact phrasing, but it's something like the, the character knew this would be very bad, but she would have to mourn it later um, because mm-hmm. this is not the time. Like now is the time to stay in heightened battle fever and do the things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I respect that. I'm kind of in awe of it, but I do observe a fair bit of like <laughs> dissociating. <laughs> like there's a lot of, we mm-hmm. can't stay present to everything that's happening because it's too much. It's too physically overwhelming. There's a lot of death, a lot of violence. Um, I, I, you know, that's a bit like hard to, hard to, fathom hard to take um but generally speaking i think my number one love of noticing these people is just their connectedness to everything around them every leaf every pathway every 
turn of the clouds and the moon and it just it feels so true and so right and so liberating to kind of bathe in that kind of reality in that reality or i'll mm. even simplify and say in reality <laughs> like it's just fantastic yeah yeah and then when we go to the romans or when the romans come to us i I had a very conflicted feeling because on the one hand, I couldn't help but identify, you know, I realized like I've been trained as a Roman. You've been trained. Yeah. We, are, we are trained in this columnar disciplined, you know, you do these things in these boxes and this is good. You know, it's yeah. why we think a farm. We love seeing you even see it. I don't know about over there, but here on the milk curtains or the trucks, the like food delivery yeah. trucks, they they stylize the beautiful farm and it's very orderly and everything's in rows and pretty little yeah. silos and fences. We're trained to see that as good. I now realize like that is Roman. Romans wanted straight lines and organized things. Well, part of me likes that. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like it's relaxing when you can find your stuff because you put it in an organized way. It's relaxing when somebody says they're going to be there at a certain time and they're there at that time. Like there's something soothing about order. And then I also am aware in myself and in that Roman culture that we see so plainly that the forcing of order is a kind of violence against self and others. And we see it over and over in the stories, the, the bravery and the strength of the soldiers at, at all levels, right? The senior, you know, the Corvus to the like everyday foot soldiers, what they withstand, what they're capable of. It's, it's admirable, but it's also like abusive beyond all measure, be, literally beyond all measure. And yeah. I, I'm saddened to notice that that pattern is the dominant pattern. It is a dominating pattern. And because it's dominating, it crushes the other stuff in its trail. So I find that uh, illuminating, but also it, I mean, the illuminating part, to be honest, is it helps me see what I'm up against. Not, not mm -hmm. because I want to like take, like dissolve all Romanness, you know, no. Yeah but notice the parts of it that are actually quite harmful to self and others, and then be honest about that and be like, well, what, what do we need to either keep that on a short leash? <laughs> uh, Cause it probably yeah. doesn't go away or like heal those parts that require such control and dominance and, and pain infliction, you know? Yeah. There, yeah there's a, there's a bit, there's a bit early on in the, fourth book no is it the end of the third book i think it's the end of the third book i've gone straight from third to the fourth so yeah it's with barely a gap so um but there's a without wanting to give anything away there's a there's a, a main character that ends up being raped repeatedly um because the Romans have decided that she she needs to be hanged for breaking some rules. And because she's a virgin, it's against the laws of Rome to hang her. And, and the twisted logic there is like, okay, so we have to make sure she's not a virgin before we can hang her. It's, and, and obviously how they remedy that situation yeah. is just astonishing. But it it did make it, it resonated for me with the way we are about rules today, right? It's like in our culture, the structures that we have, the things that are you know it it is acceptable for big companies to do things that are totally at odds with you know a, a future of prosperity for humans mm -hmm. and other ones and and that's okay because we need to deliver to shareholders it's like in what world does that logic make sense yeah you know in what world do we put spreadsheets above species it's and it, and it's we've 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 just come to accept so much stuff and that ironically reminds me of what i forgot to mention before 
which the irony is that the thing I forgot to mention is the great forgetting. Okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And so, so this is um, yeah. this assumption that we have that actually the reason our culture is is as it is is this is the best that there could be. This is the apogee that all of those cultures before were just staging posts to now what we have, which is of course the way humans were intended to be. Whereas the reality is that back 10,000 years ago, when the taker culture took hold and everyone finally settled down and did nothing but farm, within there, there was no real writing at the time. It, everything was just passed along in stories. Within two or three generations, no one could remember that it had ever not been like that. Within such a short space of time, we're talking, you know, less than 100 years, people assumed that no, it's always been like this. Humans were destined to farm. Mm -hmm. of, of course, animals wear plows because they're there to serve us. Yeah. You know, and it, it really did happen that quickly. And I feel now we're, we have the equivalent in many ways mm -hmm. that, you know, it's only a few hundred years ago that feelings of even less than that, the feelings of local community and looking out for each other. I mean, I remember, you probably remember when we were kids, um, if I did something stupid in the street and, they, and a neighbor saw me, they would come out and give me a clip around the ear and tell me not yeah. to be such an idiot. Yeah. If that happened now, Trouble. can you imagine? <laughs> but then it was, it was understood. Yeah. They were part of keeping you in line, which was right. for the best. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And your parents would go and thank them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Doing that, right now it's, and, and it's incredible how, how much we we accept about where things are as as some universal immutable truth whereas actually it's just a story that yeah. we've all bought into yeah i'm glad you remember the great forgetting and i want to just i i think offer a tiny correction which is not that oh, no one remembers but that few remember and yeah. that those who do remember or who lift up the stories of another way, who shine light on other ways of being, are either allowed to be sort of culturally interesting, right? We're yes. sort of like yes. fetishized, or there's cute movies. Disney has a friggin' field day with the thing. There's little holiday parks you can go to. Yeah. Or marginalized, uh, yeah. removed of any human rights. Yeah. Uh, or in some other way trampled mm. and yet we're here having this conversation and we're talking about books that were written in our lifetimes so I I do think it's a great forgetting mm. B says more about the great forgetting I think it's one of his lectures is actually yeah. called the great forgetting and uh, I think that's an invitation for us to be part of a remembering and that's mm. a bit of what we're, we're up to here um, there's much more I think we could both get into but I'm I'm mindful of the time so I'm going to I'm going to bring us to a close but I'm I, first I just wanted to say um you were hoping Manda writes more well it turns out I learned because I had the exact same feeling I'm almost done the fourth book and I'm like I don't want to finish um yeah. but it turns out she wrote another series called Rome and Ooh. And in fact, as very much a part of that, she was like, I wasn't ready to say goodbye to these characters. And uh, so that's my prompt to get uh, my membership at my, the library of the new neighborhood I've moved to and learn how to use nice. the library, which I haven't done for like decades. So um, that's a remembering of mine. So fear not, there's more. Um, but um, thank you for having this conversation, for sending me be, and for being open to mm. reading books in parallel and, and talking about them with me. For me, it's been game changing. I think it's literally changed the arc of my understanding of me as a human being here now and the broader arc of what might be possible and, and how and why. Um, closing thoughts from you about anything we've talked about or any invitation to folks listening. Yeah, yeah. Thank you first for suggesting we have the conversation. Um, whether anyone ends up watching this or not, it's been a really um, interesting conversation. And yes, we I'm sure we could go on um, much more and probably will next time we meet in person. Um, 
I would say anyone who's in, at all intrigued by what we've been talking about, um, the, the first of the Daniel Quinn books, Ishmael, um, which was, as I say, Story of B was the second one, um, which which follows on, but not directly. You don't have to read them in order. And then My Ishmael, the third one, which you probably should read after the, the first two. Um, but Ishmael, da Daniel Quinn was an author, a uh, writer of fiction, but also just a, a very deep thinker who'd been trying to write a, a book about where we were and how we got here as a society for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in, and in the 20th, I think it's 20th anniversary edition of Ishmael, um, he wrote a new forward where he explained that, you know, he'd been trying to do this and he'd basically given up. Um, he'd written about eight drafts and never got it to the point where he thought, no, this is something that a publisher is going to, you know, you know, go with. And I think he tried to get a couple of them published and never got anywhere. So he'd given up and was going back to normal fiction. Um, and then his wife came home with a with a press cutting for a competition, I can't remember who ran it, um, with a with a prize of half a million dollars for anyone that could come up with a work of fiction that portrayed an inspiring and credible vision for the future. And so he sat down and thought, well, I'll give it one last shot. And he wrote Ishmael and he won the prize. Um, so that's that's how Ishmael came about. Um, so thank goodness that prize came about because otherwise it would have probably, you know, gone to the grave with him. He he passed a few years ago. Um, Story of B is an incredibly good book. I would say if if you if you had to choose between the two, I would say read Story of B. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there are many many more copies floating around of Ishmael. There's a website called World of Books, um, mm -hmm. wob.com. Um, which is effectively like an Amazon, but for secondhand books. So it, it um, brings together all sorts of secondhand bookstores around the world in a, in a form that you can just order stuff and get it delivered. Um, and after I'd read um, Story of Being was halfway through Ishmael, I went onto World of Books and I ordered 20 copies of Ishmael for, I managed to get them for three pounds each, which is nothing. Um, and I've been giving them to, everyone that doesn't run away quick enough <laughs> um and i would i would really recommend anyone who's intrigued about this conversation go and get yourself a nice cheap copy of ishmael and then force it into the hands of anyone else who you think has an open mind or whose mind needs to be opened to what we need to change because if if there was one thing i could if i had one magic wish um, it would be that everyone takes the time to read Ishmael um, and then hopefully read the story would be after that. But and then go then go to Boudicca, then see what it you know, what it was really like. Um, but yeah, give that a try. That's my closing. Well, thank you. It's funny. Um, so having read all the same books uh, and then also your comment about cults earlier, I feel like part part. This isn't a cult. We're not trying to recruit anyone. No. Um, and then at the same time, we obviously have certain convictions. And let's face it, you and I have worked with some of the biggest companies in the world for many years mm. across their supply chains, in their boardrooms. Uh, we're not just like a little bit irritated. We're deeply aware of multi-billion and trillion dollar mechanisms that are currently not serving life. So I think yeah. we're coming from a common source of wishing well do we have the answers no uh but these books hit us both so hard that they serve a kind of <laughs> internal gymnastics of strengthening yeah. and and i think that's the the impetus behind this but i would actually say if you had to pick from all those books start with b so yeah. start with the story yeah. of b and yeah. then pause go with Boudicca for a little while yeah. And then if you got time, go to Ishmael. And so I think that what that says is like, there's no right path. There's no one way to get there. This is a source of material that's all around us. These are books written in English by English speakers, of course. Yeah. There's umpteen other ways to come at this sensibility. And, uh, you know, there's no right or wrong. It's more just an opportunity to explore 
what feels great and, and what does bring about connectedness. And I, I'll just th throw in a, a momentary self-promotion that I realized, as you said, that I've been sending out a newsletter to anybody who signs up to my little humble website um, since 2016. And I've, from the beginning, signed it off as yours in connectedness. And I yeah. feel like that continues to be a strong impetus. I know you've got a little one knocking on your door, so I'm going to... Yeah. I'm going to sign us off, but Jeff, thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you're open to these uh, adventures like this and to sharing books and knowledge and experience and uh, look forward to the it's a privilege. Next thank you. And the next book. Likewise. Thanks a lot. Yeah. My pleasure. Take care. We'll talk soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.